I'm Dr. Ruti from McGill University in Montreal. I am hematologist involved in HIV care for many, many years, and of course involved in a COVID-19 fight as these two epidemics collide and we are facing unprecedented event in our life, leading for CAR, for example, to have only a virtual CAR. So I will do my best to show you the interaction between COVID-19 and HIV-infected persons on management perspective, clinical, clinician experience and perspective uh, as for today in, on May uh, 2nd. So at the time uh, before the CROI uh, conference, the focus was on a PrEP for everyone at risk and to largely use uh, preventive measures to limit HIV acquisition and for HIV infected person to treat as soon as possible anyone for the benefits of the patient and also to decrease secondary transmission. And it was a big mission because we have to prevent in uh, many, many people and to treat uh, nearly uh, 14 million people worldwide with early art and to maintain long-term art. And then there uh, was uh, two days before CROI and the concern or during the virtual CROI uh, about the new combination of medication. And you can see over nearly 30 years of research and treatment, the development of new medication before the art era, beginning of art, the uh, new use of uh, integrase inhibitor would change with much less toxicity for the patient and a decrease in uh, resistance development. And we were facing two days before uh, CROI to the uh, long action uh, antiretroviral therapy like injection uh, treatment. We have also the launch of a new medication with B-therapy, the Dovato uh, therapy. And the concern at that time was getting weight in some patients, generally from uh, Africa, uh, getting weight on integrase inhibitor. And the big question was, where the NNRTI resistance still uh, matter uh, years after and at the era of integrase inhibitor or where early treat, uh, uh, study shows that it can be forgive and may overdrive the existence of the long uh, 184V mutation. So that was the spirit of that time. And then we focus also for HIV therapy to try to find the persistent HIV infected cell having HIV and to try to electively remove these cells and not damaging the immune system. And that was the time uh, two days before CROI. And then, of course, this HIV cure strategy was involved with different approach, including pro-inflammatory interleukin-15 stimulation in a monkey model, or to have a AZD, not AZT, but AZD5582, which is a non-classical NF-kappa-B stimulation of inflammation to try to push out HIV to be one day removed by the immune system or by other therapy. And we were even proud at that time uh, to have uh, at least my name be as a co-author with a US colleague on a nature paper showing at least the ability to push out under antiretroviral therapy HIV in the context of treatment with this new pro-inflammatory compound. And then came the new COVID uh, pandemic or epidemic at the beginning. Remember the uh, novel from Stefan Zeg, who wrote about the old Vienna uh, before the first uh, world war, world, and showing that it was the world of yesterday. And everything I thought I spoke about HIV before CROI looked like in this novel, the world of yesterday. And you all remember in mid-February that an epidemic start in Wuhan, expand to different uh, places in continental China, but also to Taiwan, Thailand, Cambodia, and Japan. And as you all aware, and that's why we are by virtual teleconference, 
worldwide pandemia of the famous now COVID that we listen days and night and uh, killing uh, nearly uh, close to 200,000 people worldwide and having a very strong uh, epidemics in US and lower level in Canada as of today. And you can see that uh, Canada is also touched by the COVID and the eastern part of uh, Canada more, uh, Montreal being sadly the capital of the worst uh, infection, followed by Toronto. And you can see that the infection in Canada is probably uh, around 40,000 uh, persons today, uh, inducing death or more than 1,000 people. COVID. So that's the new name for a disease. It's like AIDS. It's the name of the disease. And uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is a derivative from the, the SARS-1 uh, epidemic, uh, is the name of the virus, like AIDS and uh, HIV. And this disease can have a multi-presentation uh, form uh, from head to toes. Uh, leading to the most common, as you know, lung uh, damage, lung pneumonia, also kidney with uh, renal insufficiency, but also it's a mucosa attack. So the intestine, like the lungs, can have very similar mucosa, and therefore they can be also damaged, attacked by the virus. The brain also, because there is a lot of clot and stroke due to the huge inflammation induced by the virus, but conducted by our own body in a bad way to fight the virus, in the eyes, of course, in the nose, with a very strange uh, syndrome of uh, anopsia or agusia, so you don't uh, smell anything, and you taste uh, decrease a lot, and it's very uh, specific to this type of viral infection. And of course, uh, surprisingly, some person may have a sudden heart attack. It can be either a clot in the heart or a pulmonary emboli due to the huge uh, inflammation induced by the virus or by the body secondary to the virus. So a multi-presentation form that is not just a pneumonia, but, uh, but a total damage of the body, at least from a fraction of the population around 1% are very sick among the infected one. We know from the experience for SARS-1 uh, and HIV, there is some link between uh, this new virus and HIV infection. Because uh, all the uh, SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2 uh, are sharing with HIV Uh, some uh, protease uh, pathway, therefore protease inhibitor may be of benefits in these three diseases. And you can compare on the slide the SARS-1, the SARS-2, and they use the ACE2 uh, entry inhibitor, the equivalent of CD4 for HIV, and there is the equivalent of CCR5, which is a TMPRSS2, which is a kind of co-receptor or link to the first receptor. And this secondary receptor is a, a protease uh, enzyme. And then if you give historically uh, lopinavir or darunavir, uh, more recently, uh, you can, at least in the laboratory, uh, block the secondary re receptor of entry and may have a benefits in decreasing the severity of the disease or to prevent COVID infection. And then the majority of human beings, conversely to HIV, develop a good neutralizing antibodies, at least to health, and only a few uh, may uh, not develop good antibody. And these bad antibody may, may in fact increase immune inflammation, uh, leading to death by immune inflammation, so the body killing itself, as a bad uh, strategic defense. So that's uh, very important to link that at least we have biologically a link with uh, HIV. It is obvious that the virus came from animal in Wuhan and then as a direct human-to-human -human transmission. 
And uh, this cartoon has been presented uh, recently on a TV uh, show, showing for the first time with the big uh, round, January 24, a 63 years old lady who was from Wuhan, who went to uh, Guangzhou in south, southern China and had uh, dinner at a Chinese restaurant. Of course, we have in China, so it's not very original. And she infected four members of her family around the table during the, the lunch. However, you can see on the right side of the slide that air conditioning was on the right. And then probably the, the swirl of the wind may have pushed the virus to a table B, infected three people, and maybe also the, the changing of the, the wind direction or, or the air direction infect also uh, two people on table C, uh, posing, of course, for restaurant uh, difficulty to, uh, for ventilation and the need to put at least uh, two meters apart. It is estimated uh, uh, the distance was around one meter and 20 centimeters uh, apart from the source person, the A1 uh, with cycle red. So that's also the proof and the geographic uh, transmission that can occur within one hour of exposition only by air, not touching for table B and C and showing and exposing the dangerous transmission of this virus. Symptoms is very quite uh, common now. You, you, you listen to a TV, to any magazine, any email you receive. So it's mainly a lungs condition. And also age and sex are also a factor. That's a, a study from uh, Iceland. And you can see that younger people seems to be less infected. That's a serological testing, not a PCR testing in the blood. And you can see that male seems to be more infected. You can argue that maybe men may have more contact with other people than women. We don't know. And it's still uh, descriptive, but showing that younger People be, before the age of 15 are less prone to be infected and sick or severely ill, where it's the opposite with uh, aging population. The limited uh, immune information we have on this new virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, so uh, there is, as any virus, uh, stimulation of the interferon response, that the fast uh, track response by the body for any viral uh, infection. Of course, viral replication occur mainly in the mucosa and not in blood. Uh, it's uh, inflammation locally, activated white blood cells, the neutrophil in the mucosa, and the macrophage who release a lot of cytokine and maybe too many and in fact, it's not a good idea because it can be worse than the virus and the immune attack can be the thing that kills the host instead of cleaning the virus. Uh, there is early uh, result now of adaptive immune response. You know, it takes two to three weeks to have a more adaptive response. And of course, knowledge are three weeks uh, beyond the innate response to study. And it's a TH1 type of CD4 response and TH17 and TH17 are here to defend from uh, the mucosa from uh, infection. And of course, IgM, IgG antibody are secreted. Conversely to HIV, both CD4 and CD8 are low. A bit not low by a direct attack by the virus, but by the very high elevation of interleukin-6, who may inhibit bone marrow production of lymphocyte. And we know that lymphopenia is a very bad pronostic for people admitted with uh, COVID disease. And of course, other cells are involved and the data are relatively unknown at the time of this presentation. So why uh, we have a virus that may attack the mucosa, the lungs, and the gut, and why only a fraction of people may suffer from this virus? And we know that around 20% of infected persons may never even realize 
they were infected. They totally asymptomatic and they control the virus. We hope they have a good immune system and a good uh, antibody production that will last years. But other type of uh, similar virus immune system may uh, protect for one or two years, so it's not a long uh, term uh, protection. And you can see that there is some concept, it's not a proof, uh, that uh, the virus may damage the mucosa leading to an aberrant uh, or bias interferon response within hours after uh, infection and can lead to a lung disease in three days. And then there is a disbalance of TH1, TH17, creative a huge cytokine storm that may block the lungs, the kidney, and create an immune inflammation. Interestingly, more you age, worse it is. If you are a diabetic person with metabolic syndrome, is not good. What is paradoxical, if you are a smoker, you seem to be protected or to do better, which is a very uh, ingratitude uh, reaction for those who try to quit. And males are doing less well than females for the same age. And there is a big debate because we discuss that the virus is entering by a specific uh, cellular receptor, ACE2, and that also the site of the majority of antihypertensive medication that I am uh, taking myself. So I have a personal interest on this slide. And the question was, uh, by taking inhibitor of this pathway, do I protect myself by blocking the virus entry or by modifying the expression of the uh, mRNA of the gene coding for this receptor can be increased and then increasing the ability of the virus to infect many cells. So both the US and European Cardiology Society agrees that there is no uh, proof of any direction and time being we should keep our medication and having a bad uh, blood pressure uncontrolled can be worse than the theoretical effect on antihypertensive medication on the virus. So let's focus on HIV. We all focus on the 1990-90. So due to the uh, pandemic and many activities are stopped, HIV testing definitely should have decreased by limited access by the quarantine and social distancing. Some behaviorists and some uh, specialists in sexually transmitted disease are asking, will uh, quarantine and social distancing increase, whether decrease uh, sexually transmitted disease and uh, PrEP usage? Only uh, ongoing uh, study will tell. Linkage to care. Of course, if you are screened in a center and you need to see a doctor in a specialized uh, place, you need to have an appointment, you have to be seen soon, uh, is probably more difficult today than before. To start art, it's recommended to start ideally within a week when the patient is ready and we have all confirmatory uh, blood tests. Uh, of course, there is a fear to go to medical center, even to emergency and to see doctors. One side effect uh, I was not uh, envisioned is the long-acting intramuscular therapy uh, is a limitation and the main patient I see in my clinic and one today is those being on a study having intramuscular uh, injection in the ATLAS study showing a limitation uh, despite many advantages they have to come to the hospital to receive their uh, injection. And of course, we are thanks to the drug company involved in HIV. They give, it, uh, give us many uh, startup cars. So at least in the province of Quebec, we, don't, uh, we can have uh, uh, some co-payment paid by drug companies. Thank you. So being HIV is at worst or equal or better than being a non-HIV infected person. We had one case uh, in our unit. He had a mainly uh, sick and he stay home. He was not hospitalized in one patient of mine. And because of him, I was quarantined uh, two weeks, but I was uh, remained non-infected. And uh, 
five cases uh, in Barcelona, and you can see on the slide, a majority of people were uh, gay, were uh, young men, and they had a good CD4 uh, cells, except uh, one, and they have, one was sick, and the main has a relatively common uh, outcome. However, you can see that the age is relatively young, uh, so we don't know exactly uh, if it is uh, worse to be HIV or not, because maybe they know the hospitals, they came, it can be a bias. So still, in theory, yes, because there is immunosuppression, but the first report may not be that different. So I tried to compare what can be the, 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 the effect of being HIV at the time of COVID. So you can argue and that's a common thinking, it's a higher risk, because obviously lymphopenia of both CD4 and CD8 is official predictor of poor uh, COVID outcome in China, in Italy, in France. So that's clear cut. Immunosuppression, of course, if you are viremic and with very low CD4-8, you can be at a risk of uh, having many opportunistic infection and maybe including COVID as a new infection. There is still an inflammation even if you take A, so your immune system is still weak and there is still a lower response to, to vaccine, so there is a, a kind of uh, uh, persisting of a small default even in well-doing HIV-infected person. Is there higher social contact, so more uh, probability to acquire the virus? Conversely, many of my patients are telling they so scared being HIV and to have COVID that they take much more security, social barrier measures than many of their friends or family members. Also, having sexually transmitted disease and taking more often antibiotics may modify, as you know, the gut microbiota, including in HIV person. And we know that dysbiosis is uh, making your immune system weaker with a lower response to vaccine and maybe a lower response to defend COVID, but is unknown. And remember that male are doing worse than female, and in Canada, we are more male infected for HIV than in women. Conversely, you can argue people on protease inhibitor may block one pathway of the COVID and therefore may have a kind of natural PrEP or co-PrEP for COVID. It remains totally unknown, uh, and the patient uh, described were on integrase inhibitor. They persist with interferon level, despite with art, so they may have a natural antiviral defense on, on more than non-HIV person. And the good news, uh, we know that our population smoke generally two times more than the general Canadian population. And China, France, and Italy data uh, show that smokers are fivefold less risk to be admitted for COVID in a hospital, and it remain a big uh, unknown uh, effect. Maybe the smoking decreases the overreaction of uh, immune uh, attack by virus or by uh, benzene or particle, including in the cigarette. Remain unknown, but the observation is strong. Smokers are less infected and less sick than non-smokers without, of course, severe emphysema, just smoking. So immunosuppression may prevent uh, severe lung disease. Uh, there is some data of cancer patients, of rheumatoid-treated uh, patients with uh, immunotherapy uh, not uh, doing worse or some doing better. And there is a case of a couple in Switzerland. Uh, husband was healthy, 60 years of age, was very severely ill. The wife uh, had breast cancer with chemotherapy and has a very mild evolution. So we still don't know. And anti-IL-6 has been used or is used to treat severe lung disease. For treatment, we know that lopinavir, so protease inhibitor boosted with Norvir, at least in China, didn't do much on the disease development. However, uh, a more definitive uh, study uh, is conducted internationally to see the advantage or limitation of this medication. Redemzivir also, uh, nucleoside type, may have an effect, 
uh, early results show uh, here that there is some side effect. Uh, however, the efficacy cannot be assessed by the compassionate design published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Of course, even if you are not from Marseille, you should have uh, known that uh, Professor Didier Raoult uh, thinks that uh, hydroxychloroquine plus or minus azithromycin may be a magic bullet. Uh, there is some increased death in the US in a large uh, study. Still, uh, we don't know. The study design of all these study cannot conclude. And uh, that's why a large international study with these three, three compounds is ongoing and we should have well-designed result, hopefully, in one or two months. In Canada, it's called the discovery trial with these three arms. And there are different uh, strategies from Canada that I have found on the website on April 20th. And uh, many groups are using anti-inflammatory, interferon, even vitamin C, uh, and anti-inflammatory uh, medication like cochlicine in Montreal. Uh, uh, study are started, and we need uh, definitively a way to improve patient outcome. So, of course, for the older people uh, at this meeting, uh, remember in 1993, with Cliff Lane at the NIH, they tried to treat HIV by finding non-infected identical twin and to give a good cell, good CD4 to the infected uh, people with a very transient benefits two or three weeks after on cutaneous testing, but not clinical outcome. And this strategy obviously has been stopped. So we are doing the same thing in Canada with the Concord study, taking the plasma of pure convalescent COVID person. And we hope to start in 15 centers in Canada. HIV people are not excluded, pregnancy, Persons are not excluded from this study, and they will receive uh, half, uh, one pint of, uh, plas of plasma from a person at least uh, four weeks from infection to try to speed up the antibody fight, need to be a good neutralizing antibody uh, to uh, protect uh, people being sick and admitted to the hospital and not intubated. So we hope that this uh, strategy uh, case reports are very in favor of this strategy, which is, of course, uh, expensive and slow uh, to uh, uh, implement. So to show in parallel, HIV and COVID vaccines, that's where the everyone dream. You can see that for HIV, uh, there are different. It takes 10 years from after infection to become sick. With COVID, it can be up to three days. There is no spontaneous cure where it's 95 to 99% of cure with nothing uh, with COVID. CD4 are the attack and they are the commander in chief, whereas for COVID is a mucosa cells having the ACE2 uh, receptor. HIV is in tissue and is in blood, but COVID is mainly in tissue and the PCR level are extremely low in blood making blood tests less important to try to find a vaccine or a cure. There is no vaccine in HIV after 39 years after discovery. It's considered because the immune system remains activated and activation favorizes increased cellular entry by expressing CCR5. There is a viral evolution and immune escape within two or three days uh, while the immune system takes three weeks to, to react. The good news with the COVID, you have neutralizing antibody, mainly the spike, but also the envelope. Bad news, uh, some antibody can be very bad and may worsen the outcome of the patient, and they call uh, antibody enhancing effect. Some non-neutralizing antibody may worsen lung tissue, and that also a source of a study. And of course, to compare people having a good outcome and people having a bad outcome to understand what are the correlate of immune protection. Also, 
as any immune response, you need CD4, CD8, probably natural killer and macrophage to have a long-term cure and long-term immunity. So cells have to be also studied for COVID-19. So vaccines are in development and I put a list of different strategies used and you know, the first vaccine has been started in US last week and in England, London, two days ago. And of course, it will take years to compare those having been protected or not. And remember, we have good antibody for COVID, but sadly, we may have a bad antibody that may also increase acquisition or, or disease development. So in Quebec, we have uh, the blood banking. So we are involved in uh, collecting uh, plasma and cells from people having uh, COVID to understand the immune response, including HIV people who can participate. And we will be uh, pleased to study, to try to prevent a second wave of uh, infection. So we want also to pay tribute to the first physician, the ophthalmologist in Wuhan, who uh, tells that uh, something very bad was coming. And as you know, he was sick himself and died of COVID. And I want sincerely to thanks to his commitment and is definitely a hero. Of course, we know that our leader, Anthony Fauci, at the NIH, who is a father of the HIV uh, fight, is also not always sharing similar view with some presidents. And also for Canada, during the CAR meeting and for the CTN community, join force together to fight HIV and also COVID. And only as a group, we will bring success. And I want, as a conclusion, to say that everyone knows it's an unprecedented change in our lifetime. It's the first pandemic at the time of the electronic machine and internet and computer, where telemedicine is now my main activity. Uh, we have virtual conference and teaching. Uh, of course, all the data I present were not conducted in a randomized clinical trial, and that's the only way to have a truth of the efficacy and tolerance of the medication and also the what is the immune correlate to build a good vaccine. And as you know from TV and internet, science, emotion, and economy are fighting or are at stake, and we need a common resolution of that. And more than ever, we need a collaboration. I want to thank my team. My team is also composed of two visiting professors from China, Dr. Yu Hang and Dr. Peng. And with them, we also work with a Chinese center to fight COVID and HIV. And we recently published a review on the poss possible therapeutic option for this uh, very severe epidemic with data from uh, Canada and from uh, China. I want to thank you and be safe and let's join force to fight together the COVID epidemics in HIV infected persons. Thank you. Let me introduce myself. I'm Jean Guibari, a family physician working in HIV. I chair the consultative committee for HIV and HCV at the Ministry of Health of Quebec. This committee produces practical guides for HIV treatment, HCV treatment, PrEP and PEP for the healthcare professionals in Quebec. We were asked to produce recommendations for monitoring of HIV, PrEP and PEP during the COVID-19 era taking into account the need for decreased exposure to risk for our patient and the more limited access to some laboratory tests. First, I would like to thank the co-author of this document, Claude Fortin, Valérie Martel-Laferrière, Cécile Tremblay, Benoît Trottier, Marie-Louise Vachon. And this document has been reviewed as well. Uh, I thank all the participants who took the time uh, during this busy period to work on these recommendations. The objective of these recommendations is to optimize follow-up of people living with HIV, people receiving PrEP and PEP in the context of COVID-19 by 
reducing the face-to-face -face contact for monitoring patients, especially those who are at increased risk of infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, making better use of laboratory resources in the context of uh, COVID-19, and specify the criteria for preventive removal of HIV-positive workers from the workplace. It is well known that immunocompromised individuals are at greater risk of complication from airway infections. Uh, we've seen that with pneumonia, and that's why we vaccinate HIV patients for pneumococcal infection. Uh, not uh, without regard of their age. With the data currently available, it is difficult to estimate the risk of complication from SARS-CoV-2 infection in this population. But people with severe immune defici deficiency, including HIV-infected individuals with low CD4 receiving or not antiretroviral therapy, may be at increased risk of developing complication from SARS-CoV-2 infection. So these recommendations, in absence of data, are issued using the precautionary principle in the context of limited current uh, knowledge about SARS-CoV-2. What are the risks of complications from COVID-19? It is known from a systematic review of meta-analysis uh, of four, more than 46,000 subjects infected with COVID-19. All these cases occur in Chinese hospitals and they compare uh, those with non-severe infection to those with more severe infection, and they look at the risk factors of having a more severe infection. And they find high uh, odds ratio for having a more severe infection in the presence of hypertension, a 2.3-fold increase, cardiorespiratory system disease, 2.4-fold increase, and cardiovascular disease, 34 fold increase. For diabetes, there was a two-fold increase, but this uh, was not significant. So other smaller studies, though, have found that there is a higher risk of complication associated with diabetes. So here you see the result of this meta-analysis, and you see that hypertension, respiratory disease, and cardiovascular disease have a significant increased risk in this meta-analysis, uh, including eight studies that were in this analysis. But diabetes, although there is an odds ratio of two, does not reach the significance in this analysis. So the risk of complication from COVID-19 and HIV. For HIV, there is no uh, real data uh, assessing the risk of uh, complication from covid in HIV patients, there are some uh, publications about small number of patients who did well with COVID-19, even if they were HIV positive. But we have to take into account, since the median age of our courts of patients is more than 50 years old in Canada, that many of our patients will have cardiovascular problem, respiratory disease, and high blood pressure, which will increase their, their risk and the age increased the risk as well. So INES, which is uh, l'Institut National d'Excellence en Santé, have been asked to better define what is immunosuppression. And they did a review of the literature, especially based on data that come from the, um, the, the vaccination area. So they defined for HIV three categories of immunosuppression the severe immune deficiency or what they call the symptomatic HIV AIDS, which are person living with HIV whose CD4 cell count is below 200, or who have a history of an AIDS defining illness without immune reconstitution, or who show clinical signs of symptomatic HIV. So this is the uh, definition from the CDC as well and Health Canada. Uh, there is another category, the lim limited immune deficiency. So these are the asymptomatic adults with CD4 count in the range of 200 to 499. And other conditions are considered medical condition without significant immunological compromise. So 
having defined these categories, they as well state that a particular vigilance should also be paid to the, the following person. So individual over uh, age 65 or older, individual with a respiratory system disease, individual with a cardiovascular disease, and individual with hypertension. These criteria will be taken into account later in my talk when we'll uh, speak about removing uh, HIV uh, workers from their work workplace. So now let's look at how we can optimize the medical monitoring of HIV infection. So there are precautions for all persons living with HIV. They should, like everyone of us, all respect the hand hygiene, the respiratory etiquette, to cough in your elbow, to wear mask if you're sick, uh, respect the social distancing, two meters, um, update the pneumococcal vaccination if it's required, consider influenza vaccination for the next influenza season next fall, because for now, uh, the season is considered closed and there is no more need to do uh, influenza vaccination at this time of the year. Reduce the risk of exposure by reducing medical and pharmacy visits whenever possible. So how do we do that? Um, we should try to decrease the frequency of face-to-face -face medical calls. We should encourage medical calls by telephone or telemedicine. Postpone non-urgent calls. Avoid change in antiretroviral therapy that may require additional medical calls, except in the case of therapeutic failure, of course, intolerance or significant drug interaction. So it's not time to just modernize treatment if there is not a specific reason to do a treatment change. And prescribe a sufficient amount of medication up to the next call. For patients who have severe immunosuppression, so those who have AIDS or CD4 below 200, it is strongly recommended as much as possible to avoid medical calls at the hospital or clinic for these patients. If they require a visit to an outpatient clinic, it is suggested to advise the clinic and the patients to identify themselves upon arrival as protective precaution patients. These patients should not be seated in the waiting room and not in the respiratory area of the waiting room, uh, of course. Upon arrival, the patient must be taken to an isolation room that is not used for COVID-19. The personnel in contact with the patient must carry out protective and precautionary measure, hand hygiene, remove the lab coat, which is probably maybe uh, contaminated, and wear a procedural mask. If a patient is hospitalized and is uh, HIV positive, antiretrovirals should not be discontinued. So, and especially patients who are on research protocol and taking investigational drug, uh, all effort should be done to continue this medication uh, if possible uh, by reaching the clinical study managers. Some antiretroviral treatments are available in liquid formulation and some pills can be crushed for critically ill patients who need to be fed through a tube. Intubation, in case of intubation, clinicians should contact an HIV specialist to discuss how best to continue the patient antiretroviral therapy while the patient is intubated. When the patient is receiving a study treatment or an off-label treatment for COVID-19, we should always check for potential drug interaction between treatment for COVID-19 and antiretroviral as well as any other drugs that are given to the patient. So all the information about potential drugs interaction can be found in the mono product monograph, uh, drug interaction resources, uh, clinical trials protocols, or research, research brochures. 
When available, clinicians may consider inviting patients to enroll in a clinical trial e evaluating the safety and efficacy of investigation treatment for COVID-19. And we should remember that persons living with HIV should not be excluded from these trials. So what should we do with antiretroviral therapy? For naive patient, it's not recommended to delay the onset of ART after diagnosis confirmation. But we have to consider that some laboratory, laboratory tests could be delayed, such as genotypic resistance tests and HLA testing. So we should then start the treatment as we could do in the rapid start situation uh, before results of these tests, genotyping and HLA are known by using drugs that have a high genetic barrier to resistance and a low potential for transmitted resistance in our population. So if treatment is initiated before resistance testing is available, it should include a combination of two NRTI plus either preferably dolutegravir or bictegravir or as an alternative darivnavir boosted with ritonavir or cobicistat. So note that only triple therapy is recommended in this case because we don't have the resistance testing. And abacavir cannot be part of the two NRTI that will be used in this regimen uh, without having a result for the HLA testing. So what should be the initial assessment of uh, HIV positive patient? We should collect the same initial workup for this patient. The result taking into account, like we said before, that the result of some tests will be delayed. And to reduce the medical calls, we should use for screening of tuberculosis, uh, the interferon gamma release test instead of the tuberculin skin test. Or we could think of delaying this screening in a low risk uh, population. Once a patient is under treatment or for all the other patients that are under treatment, we should space the visit up to six months apart and more as needed for stable patients who show good adherence to their medication. We should try to conduct medical calls by telephone or telemedicine and some less urgent tests could be postponed. For example, a screening for STI in low risk asymptomatic individual female cervical cytology and anal swabs for homosexual men as well, a bone densitometry and plasma dosage of drug or test for viral tropism when these tests are not urgently needed. For art dispensation, we should consider providing at least 30 days supply of medication. And when it See, so it's possible, and it depends on your jurisdiction, up to 90 days when it's possible in agreement with the pharmacies. Take into account uh, financial barriers to medication access due to the financial strain imposed by COVID-19, and when it can be helpful, use the manufacturer's financial support program for continued uh, antiretroviral therapy where appropriate. For the patient, it can send a messenger to pick up the medication after agreement with the pharmacist, and he could use home delivery services when it's available. For the PrEP, we should follow the guidelines like the Canadian guideline for HIV PrEP and PEP that has been published a few years ago, or uh, in Quebec, the Guide pour les professionnels de la santé uh, pour la prophylaxie pré-exposition. We should encourage monitoring by telephone or telemedicine. We should maintain the initial call and the month one call to rule out HIV infection before prescribing and continuing PrEP prescription. And for those who are on treatment, we should space monitoring calls every six months for patients who are at low risk of STI and HIV and who have shown perfect adherence to continuous or intermittent PrEP when they had risk. But for those who are at a higher risk, we should maintain closer STI and HIV screening like every three months, like it's proposed in the guidelines. 
prescribe a sufficient amount of medication until the next follow-up call, when this call is postponed, like six months instead of three months of uh, medication. For PEP, again, we should follow the guidelines, the Canadian guidelines and the uh, Quebec guidelines. Consider, again, uh, conducting calls by phone or telemedicine when possible. In sexual PEP follow-ups, screening for STI and HIV sometimes require face-to-face -face visit when the serving laboratory does not collect samples from extragenital sites. In this context, the month-one assessment can be ignored when the risk is low and the patient consents. Uh, the patient needs to be reminded to use protection when having sex. In occupational PEP follow-ups, consider conducting only telephone and telemedicine calls whenever possible. If the exposed worker can have a follow-up test performed at a laboratory near their work, sometimes they work in hospital or in clinics, uh, send the uh, administrative paper, uh, in Quebec is the CNESST, by mail or online when this is available. So now we'll address the preventive withdrawal of HIV workers from the workplace. So I have to remember you that these recommendations are issued using the precautionary principle in the context of limited current knowledge about SARS-CoV-2. Ines has defined which case of immunosuppression should have a preventive withdrawal for work from work. And you see here an enumeration of condition where there is a significant immunosuppression that could increase the risk of uncomplication by COVID-19. And you see that person living with symptomatic HIV AIDS are in this category. And I remember you the definition, which are patient with symptoms of HIV AIDS or patient with CD4 below 200 cells by millimeter cube. So which are the recommendations for workers with severe immuno, immune deficiency? So for these workers, we recommend as a first step to promote remote work or working from home. If teleworking is not possible, the employer must ensure through reassignment or the application of various uh, workplace control measures that the following conditions are met. Working with a two meter separation distance from customers and other colleagues. And if it's not possible, use of a physical barrier such as a plexiglass pane or equivalent. We should avoid face-to-face -face meeting and gatherings where the two meters distancing cannot be adhered to. And in general, these meetings in the workplace should be avoided regardless of, this, of social distancing. Availability on the workplace of the necessary equipment for application of hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette for workers. Disinfecting commonly used work equipment between each use and ideally using dedicated personal work equipment and not sharing this equipment between workers. Effective processes for the identification and immediate removal from the workplace of individuals with symptoms of COVID-19. General cleanliness of the environment with respecting uh, the disinfection instructions that are listed here. And if it is not possible to comply with these conditions, the worker must be reassigned immediately so as to eliminate close contact with customers and coworkers. So these were for patients with severe immunodeficiency. So what should we do with other patients who have limited immune deficiency, like those who have CD4 between 200 and 499? So for these patients, we should decide on a case-by-case -case situation and take into account other conditions that should lead to a greater vigilance, like hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, and lung disease as comorbidities, an age over of 65 or over. 
And for this case, clinical judgment based on work-related risk should be applied. So here is an example of a medical certificate, and I use the one that is currently proposed at the SHUM. So in this medical certificate, we do not identify the medical condition of the patient. So we translated it in English. So it started from the above patient as a health condition that puts them at risk of serious complication in case of respiratory infection. In the current exceptional context related to the COVID-19 pandemic, as attending physician, I issue the following recommendation. And there you have a few choice, allowing the patient to work from home, certain change in the work environment must be made immediately, implementing measure for washing hands and as frequently as possible and implementing social distancing measure. Due to the particle nature of the task performed, the patient should be reassigned to tasks that do not involve a risk of exposure to COVID-19. And you could do other suggestions and state that if these measures cannot be implemented, and because of the application of the precautionary principle, I consider that this patient should be removed from the workplace. Or you could simply uh, tick the last box. Because of the application of the precautionary principle, I consider this patient should be removed from the workplace. So what about the return to work for a minimal suppressed patient after COVID-19? I encourage you to check the updates online because those who issue these recommendations change them. For now, there is no uh, difference with the non-immunosuppressed patient about the duration of isolation. Isolation is lifted 14 days after the onset of acute illness, the first symptoms, and after the absence of fever for 48 hours without taking antipyretic drug and the absence of acute symptoms for at least 24 hours. And these acute symptoms exclude residual cough or anosmia that may persist after the cure of COVID-19. Confirmed case of COVID-19, OR healthcare workers must meet other criteria. You can find uh, these criteria for Quebec at the side that is given in reference. So they would need to have two uh, negative PCR on two different respiratory samples before returning to work. So I hope these recommendations will be helpful. I want to thank you for your attention and thanks all the authors and reviewers, those who wrote guidelines that helped us in putting all this together, l'Institut National de Santé Publique du Québec, l'Institut National d'Excellence en Santé et en Services Sociaux, l'équipe Santé au Travail du CHUM et le programme national de mentorat sur le VIH et les hépatites, which will be responsible for the diffusion of this uh, document.